Hi there. What is neoliberalism? We hear the term very often, but rarely see it defined. Supposedly, we live under neoliberalism now, but how, exactly? It has liberal in the name, isn't that supposed to be good? <laughs> no, not really, but we'll get into that. The general thesis of tax cuts for the rich and budget cuts for public programs is kind of relevant, but not exactly all that neoliberalism entails. As a system, neoliberalism ramped up during the very beginning of the dismantling of European social democracy from the 80s onwards. Initially, post-World War II, a grand rebuilding of Europe, combined with the sheer popularity of socialist forces, both in the form of political parties in France, Italy, etc., as well as the influence of then-existing socialist nations such as the USSR, with its full employment, free healthcare and education, extensive social benefits amongst all the rest, resulted in a choice for the ruling classes of the re-emerging European nations. Either they acquiesce to the general demands represented by socialist forces without giving up their power, or risk losing power through revolution mixed with popular electoral action. They picked the former, and so was European social democracy born. Of course, unlike in socialist countries, social democratic countries supported their social programs through neo-colonial, imperialist and otherwise exploitative relations with the economic periphery, which today runs to the level of over 10 trillion dollars if you can believe it. If you're interested in the details, check out my unequal exchange video here. The details and foundations of what would become neoliberalism extend back into the 30s actually, but that's too much detail for the current analysis, so read the new way of the world, our neoliberal society, if you're interested. Anyways, this state of affairs remained till the 1980s, in which a boldened group of ideologues, usually represented by the ghoulish features of Thatcher and Reagan, thought differently on how the ruling class should exercise their power, and how the system set up entirely to serve their interests should be a lot more blatant in that aspect. This wasn't some idea that fell from the skies either, instead it had real material reasons for its emergence. Over two generalized recessions, 1974-5 and 1980-82, the capitalist system suffered an accumulation crisis that was qualitatively and quantitatively different from a cyclical downturn. All at once, capitalist countries confronted sluggish economic growth, high unemployment, a collapse in investment, dwindling world trade, and skyrocketing inflation. This economic contraction was defined by a long-term decline in profitability. To draw a concrete definition, neoliberalism is a set of economic and political views and policies used to administer a capitalist state which is characterized by attacks on, or even the total destruction of, many previous concessions to the working class, welfare, and other social programs. This takes the form of a wide variety of actions, including the dismantling or sidelining of labor unions, the rewriting or deletion of pro-labor legislation, the lowering of real wages, meaning not necessarily less total income, although that happens too, but a reduction of the value of wages adjusted for inflation, essentially meaning you can buy less stuff despite the amount you're making not going down all that much, which is what we've seen plenty of since COVID. Attacks on pension plans, such as with the recent protests in France, reduced regulations for corporations, specifically in the fields of labor safety, benefits, and environmental protections, the lowering of taxes for corporations and the wealthy, the removal of barriers to so-called free trade, which we'll get into in a second, amongst other developments. Much more relevant, though, is neoliberalism as an ideological dogma, in which everything should be left to the market. Maternity leave, climate change, you name it, supposedly the market will solve it and solve it best. The more deregulation, the more quote-unquote healthy an economy is. This way of thinking emerged as a result of the various contradictions facing highly developed capitalist countries, and by extension the general contradictions of capitalism themselves. At first, it made political and economic sense to grant concessions in the form of social democracy, but that no longer flies. Crises of overproduction, in which more stuff is produced than there is demand for, leading to critical losses for enterprises, to overly simplify, the falling rate of profit, which is a measurable tendency under capitalism in which automation, as well as standard organizational development of enterprises, results in less total profits, essentially destroying the system in the long run as profit is required for capital reinvestment so that capitalism as a system can continue, amongst others. These changes result in those earlier social democratic concessions no longer being practical, and hence for the sake of corporate profits are quickly and entirely eliminated, or at least a powerful attempt is made at just that. For an overview of these concepts, the falling rate of profit, etc., check out my 101 videos here. In a sentence, neoliberalism is a general policy of shifting and taking out all the negative effects of the worsening capitalist economic crisis on the regular working people. This is done through leaving social distribution to the market solely, or at least attempting to do so. What exactly does free market capitalism and leaving it to the market really entail, though? Essentially, free markets means no social or government interference in the market. 
Concretely, this also extends to how enterprises are run. Capitalists own the means of production, meaning land, factories, natural resources, etc., and lord over it, believing that everything to do with their means of production and products produced thereof should be completely and unilaterally up to them. They set whatever wages, meaning no minimum wage or other pesky government mandate, do whatever they want with waste, dump it in the river, why not? Sell to whoever at whatever price, crack on the playground, reinvest their profits however they like, you name it. I'm being comedic, but in essence this total freedom is the essence of so-called free markets. Better examples include horrifically low wages for dangerous work, increased environmental pollution, price hiking of vital goods such as medicines, amongst other examples. This freedom is contradictory as social organization ends up being incredibly one-sided. Local communities, workers, or the government have no say in the production process or its byproducts under this model. Only capitalists do. As a result, this is less quote-unquote free and more an ideological setup used to make the system the most convenient solely for owners in an explicitly anti-democratic way. Of course, this ideological posturing is contradictory too, as real historical practice shows that they pretend to not like government interference so long as it doesn't benefit them directly, and when in power, they make plenty use of it. Neoliberals have tried to bend the state into promoting markets at every level of society, in essence using state power for political means, which is a pastime of all socioeconomic systems. To note though, this isn't trying to stand neoliberalism against a so-called pure capitalism. They're both capitalism, but neoliberalism is the current practice and is especially mask off. On the point of freedom, let's get on a slight detour to a little known Georgian poet and political activist who said, it is difficult for me to imagine what personal liberty is enjoyed by an unemployed person who goes about hungry and cannot find employment. Real liberty can exist only where exploitation has been abolished, where there is no oppression of some by others, where there is no unemployment and poverty, where a man is not haunted by the fear of being tomorrow deprived of work, of home, and of bread. Only in such a society is real and not paper, personal and every other liberty possible. The relevance of these words will be even clearer as we go on. Leaving it to the market entails the supremacy of market competition, with subsequent market winners and losers being delegated to differing fates. That being political power and protection for the position of market winners, and the inverse for those that lose in the market or never take part, meaning regular workers and everyone else. This goes likewise for previously state-delivered services such as education and healthcare. Neoliberalism in practice didn't abolish them but instead attempted to entirely privatize them and subject them to market forces. Taxation or otherwise citizen-funded endeavors extend only so far as to maintain and grow market relations. Nowhere was this more blatant than in Chile, in which the CIA-backed dictator Pinochet overthrew the democratically elected socialist Allende and afterwards instituted a mass privatization system which included, amongst others, private hospitals, private insurance firms, and private schooling all on market basis with workers forced to fund the emergence and maintenance of these new markets. The consequences of these policies resulted in 42% of Chileans living in poverty by the end of Pinochet's reign, as income and quality skyrocketed. Following Pinochet's footsteps, but straight-jacketed by their surface-level commitment to democracy, Thatcher in the UK and Reagan in the US attempted likewise to introduce this concept of competition in every sphere. And the forceful imposition of market relations on public services took place, along with restricting labor unions, cracking down on strikes, and of course skyrocketing inequality. With Thatcher, household debt increased from 37% to 70% of GDP, unemployment hit 9.5% by 1984, 15% of the UK's industrial base was wiped out in just a few years, entire communities disappeared, with Scotland losing 20% of its workforce as a result. In the most insidious of policies, Thatcher's government brought in the right to buy scheme in 1980. This allowed social housing tenants to buy the properties they lived in from their local government office. This quickly dried up the government's supply of social housing, which combined with declining construction of housing, resulted in a sharp marketization of housing, with house prices rising over 1,000% since 1980, making it all but impossible for young people to buy even the cheapest homes in their area. This was all by design. I won't mention Reagan today because I'd rather you sleep soundly tonight. Here enters the IMF, who in the early 80s, along with the World Bank, became the global purveyors of neoliberal orthodoxy. The model was simple. An overexploited third world nation, usually a former colony that only recently became independent, is burdened by inequalities and industrial deficiencies as a result of colonialism. These nations also usually were economically sanctioned or otherwise limited by their former colonial masters, who would demand colonial taxes even after independence. Through high interest funds borrowed from the IMF, said nations couldn't pay back everything to the letter that the IMF desired, usually by design, and as a result would be forced to undergo so-called structural adjustment programs, where welfare cuts, liberalization of the market, and privatization took place, usually with ownership transferring back from said third world state to the former colonial power or whatever imperialist hegemon be they local or global. 
This is going on to this day, with the most recent being IMF payments to Ghana, which historically came with strings attached such as raising electricity and water tariffs, mass privatization of water resources and mining facilities, cuts to public sector employment, and other so-called cost-cutting measures. Ghana currently pays between 70% and 100% of government revenue to meet these requirements each year in a cycle meant to keep them paying to the benefit of the imperial core. Likewise with Egypt that has agreed to sell off $2 billion worth of state assets along with slashes to public sector spending, the cutting of state subsidies which over 30 million Egyptians in poverty rely on to keep basic staples affordable, as well as privatization of over 30 state-owned companies ranging from water purification to oil and gas. If you're interested in how deep this systematic overexploitation of the global south goes, take a look at my video titled Why Do Poor Countries Stay Poor? That's for nations, how about for people? Neoliberalism applied socially abides by the two nonsense maxims of if you work harder you'll do ever better in life, despite lacking the nuances of generational wealth, ethnic, racial or gender discrimination, systemic ceilings, amongst many other things. The second being, if you don't make it in the system it's a personal failing, it's solely your fault. You're too lazy to save, too lazy to get and maintain a job, too lazy to work harder, and that's why for example those interest rates on medical bills you have outpace your ability to pay them, keeping you in poverty. This last bit is tongue in cheek. Essentially, they strip nuance away and attempt to personalize reasons for systematic social failings such as homelessness, unemployment and poverty. This extends naturally to taxation. Firstly, for a Marxist view on taxation, take a look at this video here. A quick TLDR though is, taxation is relatively insignificant compared to the surplus value extracted out of you each working day, that being the value you produce above what goes to supplying your wage. Anyways, since becoming wealthy supposedly naturally results from working harder, taxing the wealthy disincentivizes hard work. This could reduce their overall investment in their businesses apparently and as a result is intervention in the market, which we cannot stand for. Likewise with the aforementioned privatization of government services, less unions, less worker protections, increased likelihood of destitution if you were to be fired as no safety nets exist. All of these are pro-market strategies that reverse the prioritization of so-called lazy workers who got unnecessary assurances that they won't be kicked out through worker protections, that they won't be made destitute by bills as healthcare was public, so on and so forth. A desperate working class with no protections is far more agreeable to whatever terms the capitalist class dictates and as such ruling class power is further entrenched. This is class struggle. Nowhere did this take on more geopolitically catastrophic consequences than in Eastern Europe where a rapidly declining population and skyrocketing poverty equaled wartime levels during the market liberalized peace of the 1990s. I cover this more extensively in my video Ghost Towns The Silent Depopulation of Eastern Europe here. In the end, should capitalist power be threatened, this thinned out facade of democracy would be shed entirely as fascism emerges to protect the wealth, property and capital of that class as its scapegoats, immigrants or women or Jews or communists or whoever else. My video Why Does Everyone Hate the West goes into further detail if you're interested. Whether neoliberal or not, capitalism is a system that has outlived its usefulness and it's time to go beyond. As to the why and where will we go afterwards, check out my twin videos on capitalism and socialism here. That's all for this time, if you enjoy what I do then please consider supporting me on Patreon, it really does help. I'd like to thank my patrons, so thank you to... Vitan, Kelsil, Furry Beaver, <laughs> Dick Wolf, okay come on, The Sebester, The Sepster, Gus Carlissel, Wyatt, Jasonian Ringu, Jack Leary, Erlen Borda, Anatole Erison, Nanya Biss, <laughs> Sleuthmakers, Gary the Gary, Torin Rettig, Misling, Ray Blue, Daniel, Lena Yumin, April, Neox, Saraktonos, Jacob Corvinius, Cayenne Berberi, Exploding Turtle, Vanish, Gold, Blimbo, Augustus Limond, and Professional Strawberry. Thanks for watching.